leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Dr. Jim Lowe, a longtime Iowa Cityan, enjoyed a successful and satisfying career as a veterinarian. He treated dogs of all sizes, cats of many temperaments, rats, birds, marmots, dairy cattle, other farm stock, and even a tiger. A native of Memphis, Tennessee, Jim moved to Iowa City in 1957 to open his practice. He worked alone for 10 years caring for sick animals and even doing his own bookkeeping. In 1965, he built a clinic building, the first of its kind in the state of Iowa. In 1982, the governor appointed Jim to the State Board of Veterinary Examiners. He served two terms. His community involvements include president of the Noon Rotary Club, the advisory board of Mercy Hospital, the board of the Visiting Nurses Association, and numerous local and state veterinary committees. Jim is an active member of St. Andrew Presbyterian Church. In 1992, Jim retired from practice, but keeps busy with golf, fishing, travels, and reading. He and his wife, Gwen, raised two children in Iowa City, Kathy and Steve. They have two grandchildren, Ian and Jeff. Welcome to One of a Kind, Jim. This will be fun, I know, for, especially for cat and dog lovers. <laughs> Your story, I know, begins in Memphis, Tennessee in 1925. Tell me a little bit about your family and what were they about doing? Well, you're making me a year older than I am. I was born in 1926. Oh, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was one of four children. Uh, I was the middle child. I had an older brother, Lawrence, an older sister, Anne, and a younger brother, Phil. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad, uh, we lived in the same house until I was 21 years old. That was my only address, 802 Mina Street in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, we had a, my dad was a traveling salesman. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of strict. So we were kind of glad when he was gone all week <laughs> because when he came on the weekends and mom would uh, line us up and tell him what we had done wrong, you know, and uh, we had a peach tree out back that got a pretty good workout. A switch or two uh, on the behind. Two, yeah. <laughs> but it was, I guess, uh, in those days when I, uh, he didn't necessarily spare the rod, but it was just a peach tree. Mm -hmm. so. But I had a, you know, a normal, a good life uh, uh, growing up in, in Memphis. And, and, uh, it was a union town, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And it, uh, that affected your family because it affected your grandfather. Yes, it did. Uh, my, my dad, actually, uh, my mother and father both had kind of uh, uh, sad uh, uh, happenings in their life. Uh, my dad, when he was two years old, my grandfather picked him up and, and abandoned my grandmother. And uh, he, he was a union organizer for the railroad. And he traveled all over Kansas and, and Arkansas and Tennessee and uh, raised dad until he was, uh, until dad was 12. My grandfather was shot in the back and killed. Uh, by in Memphis? In, in, uh, no, it was in, oh. in Kansas. But he was organizing the railroad. Uh, in those days, uh, the Union, uh, this was tough business, and uh, one of the thugs uh, for the railroad company shot him in the back and killed him. So Dad was essentially left alone mm. when he was 12 years old. And uh, I know that many people had befriended him when he was, he sold newspapers on the, on the railroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, his aim in life was to find his mother, which he didn't have any idea where she was. And I really don't know how he ultimately found her, but he did. He, f he was 17 years old when he found my grandmother, and she lives in, uh, lived in Arkansas, mm -hmm. and she had remarried. 
and that's the grandfather I knew, uh, uh, Grandfather Jones. He had a sawmill in, in, in a little small town in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. But Dad, uh, he only went to the eighth grade as far as he, uh, and how he supported himself in those days, uh, why he didn't end up in a, in a home orphanage somewhere, I don't know. But he said that many people offered to uh, take him in and educate him, and, and, but he was very independent and, and uh, so he wanted to find his mother, and he did. Hmm. And, uh, what a story. And my mother, uh, her father, uh, he was, they lived in Millington, Tennessee, and he was uh, a successful uh, lumber man and a lot of lumbering going on in, in Tennessee. And they were quite prosperous. And I, I had pictures of my mother. She had two sisters, and they were uh, rode horses and horse shows. And I, they, in those days, they rode side saddle. But uh, then, when she was in high school, where well, my grandfather uh, Ward was his name, mm -hmm. Tom Ward, uh, he went off and, and, and uh, abandoned the family. They didn't hear from him for years. And so my grandmother, uh, she never remarried. She took in sewing, I guess, and uh, mm -hmm. I kept the, the girls together. I, wanted, I, knew, I know that he was from Ireland, I had come over when he was a boy of 12 with his, his father, uh, my mm -hmm. mother's dad. I am wanting to retrace some of the family history, so uh, we couldn't find anything in our, our uh, family uh, memorabilia. So I wrote my aunt, who was the youngest girl. She was the only living. My mother died and mm -hmm. her older sister. So I wrote my aunt, who lived in Orlando. I asked her where uh, Tom had come from. And she wrote back just one short sentence, from hell. <laughs> <laughs> she was very bitter <laughs> when he abandoned. So, but uh, uh, mom and dad met when uh, dad was in the service. He mm -hmm. met in Millington, was stationed there, and, and they were married and, and uh, moved to Memphis shortly after, and, and he got a job with Corn Products Sales mm -hmm. Company. And, and your mother was raising these four kids, and you played sports in high school and junior high, and... Uh, yeah, all my free time was spent uh, at the... I was a gym rat, really, you know, and... and uh, boxing? Boxing. I you was, were a champion? I was a Golden Glove champion of Memphis uh, when I was a junior in high school. And then you, did you have pets at that age? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we lived right in town, uh -huh. and, and, uh, but Mom was very tolerant. She let me have... I uh, had everything from a white rat to a canary, cats, dogs, uh, even had a pet chicken. I, uh, but I, I did. I love animals. You loved and animals. So right after you graduated from Memphis High School, you um, you had your military career. Tell me about this. Well, <laughs> this is kind of uh, uh, interesting. When I was 17, my buddies and I, three or uh, four of us, went down and joined the uh, Air Force Reserve. You know, picture of Uncle Sam, you too mm. can wear silver wings. Well, that, that's for us. So we joined the Air Force Reserve, and they didn't really call you until you were 18. So when I graduated, I and my buddies graduated, I was still 17, and they called my buddies up right away. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the War Department and said, I, I want to go with my friends. You know, we joined together, and, and, uh, and they said, no. At that time, well, this was in, in uh, uh, May of, uh, June of 44, mm -hmm. and uh, they had uh, 50,000 too many pilots at that time, so uh, they were not anxious to take you in, and uh, mm -hmm. the cadet, this was a cadet program. But uh, I ultimately finally called me, and I went in, and, and uh, uh, I spent most of my time in, in Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> so <laughs> I was, I was uh, fought the Battle of Back Bay in Biloxi. Oh, my so, goodness, for two uh, years for you two were down years. there. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, About my, we were in this cadet program, and so we went through basic training at Keesler. And then they didn't know what to do with all those cadets because the things were winding down, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so they sent us what they called advanced basic. And it was exactly the same thing <laughs> we had taken before. The same lectures and the same 20-mile uh, hikes and the same uh, firing range and the whole bit. But uh, anyway, that was uh, 
my military career wasn't particularly distinguished, but uh, I, I But did, it got it, you a GI Bill, you bet, said. Then uh, that got you into, you were out in Colorado, college. then to college. Yeah, right. Tell me what, what did you, well, there was one person I read in your bio that really had a big influence on you when you were young. Tell me about this Slim Anderson, great name. Well, uh, he was a unique man. In fact, when I started in uh, uh, college, in freshman English, one of our, our chores was to write a, a theme on my most unforgettable character. Mm -hmm. Well, that was slim for me because he was a unique individual. But I have to go back to when I was 15, and uh, this was, again, during the war. Mm -hmm. This was in 40, 43, and uh, uh, there were big headlines, you know, we need labor out in Kansas to harvest the wheat harvest because a lot of the, uh, the farm boys had gone off, you know, to the service. Mm -hmm. So my next door neighbor and I, I don't, still don't know how my parents allowed us to do this, but uh, uh, we got on a bus, and my buddy and I, Charles Katie, and we went out to, uh, to uh, Garden City, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Went into an employment office and sat until somebody came along and hired us. And this happened to be slim, which was lucky for us because uh, uh, we were so green. You know, we... we 15 that years age, old? We, yeah, 15. 15. We were, didn't drive. We had never operated a farm machine. You know, we were city boys, you know. Mm -hmm. We were raised in Memphis. <laughs> and so we knew nothing about this, but we, we were strong and, and willing, and, uh, and slim, I think he got a kick out of us. We made a lot of goofy uh, mistakes when we were there, but... Uh, uh, getting the tractor in reverse and running through a fence and <laughs> <laughs> things like that, and, or cutting it too high or too low or the wheat, but uh, it was a great experience. And, and Slim was, we got a kick out of him because he was, uh, he had lived all of his life in Kansas. And he said his family during the Dust Bowl years, they were so poor that they, they couldn't do like the Okies and migrate, they, just, they couldn't even afford to migrate. So they stuck the Dust Bowl years mm. out and, and uh, uh, he said he'd wake up many times in the morning, and even though, and your pillow, you just see the outline of your head, you know, from the dust. The dust. Hmm. So he, when he was a young man, he moved from the farm into town, and, and, and he was an auto mechanic, and he was an excellent mechanic. Then he decided to go back to farming. And when we knew him, he had about 3,000 acres of, of that uh, dry uh, land, uh, wheat country to, uh, farm, was very successful. We got a kick out of him because he he swore continuously. You know, we naive uh, boys and and the not that boys raised are right. real naive. Yeah, we were raised right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but Chuck and I one day we just kind of kept track. He was working on something uh -huh. uh, uh, mechanical and and I think we counted 26 swear words <laughs> in about two minutes. <laughs> so it, it, he, another thing that Slim did uh, he uh, uh, was the lay preacher for the little church. We were 18 miles out from the nearest town was called Leota. And it was 50 miles from Garden City, but out in the middle of nowhere. But this little church, they had the regular minister would come once a month. Well, in between, Slim would preach. And I remember one day he was preaching a sermon that would bring tears to your eyes, you know, and he was just so emphatic. And the fly was kind of buzzing around him, and he was going along, and all of a sudden, he'd Damn fly. <laughs> but that was so natural for him. But and they he, all accepted it. Oh, yeah. He just, just went right on. And, and, uh, but <laughs> he later became a state legislator in he Kansas. Did. And, and, uh, uh, well, he's good to you, though, wasn't he? he? Oh, wonderful. And, and he, uh, I worked five different summers out there. A uh, couple of summers after we got out of the service, uh, we, uh, in between mm -hmm. college vacation, we'd, uh, we worked out there. And then he'd stopped and visited us in, uh, in Memphis. Uh, but he was a... Did you ever find man. out what happened to Slim? Well, oh yeah. I mean, we kept track uh -huh. of him. And uh, uh, we, we'd stop by and uh, visit him on the way out to, to Colorado. And, and, uh, but they, they, he had no children. And so, so you were kind yeah. of his family. We were his family, the, the boys that worked for him. And he was a, he was a great, great, he and Ellie, it was his, both were wonderful. Mm -hmm. Tell me, you were, you said on your way to Colorado, you'd stop and see him. You were in Colorado uh, in going to vet school, right? Well, or was there yeah, something? that was afterward. I, you know, kind of going back and forth here, but when I got out of the service, I started school at Memphis State. Mm -hmm. And I went to Memphis State for a year, and I started out in business. And uh, so I completed a year of business there, and then I had a 
a friend that had moved to Arizona during the war years, and he called me and said, this is a great place, why don't you come out here? So I did. I switched to Phoenix City College then uh, and continuing on my business. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know it was in some real dull class in economics one day. I can still s know how I felt that mm -hmm. particular day. It was warm and I had my hand on my <laughs> desk and, <laughs> and uh, economics was just not reaching me. And I, I said, you know, this is not for me, uh, this business career. Mm -hmm. So. I took some, some uh, uh, career uh, testing things later, and, and my aptitude was heavy in, in uh, the medical field, but I really had no desire to be an MD mm -hmm. uh, or a dentist or some of the other fields. And I said, well, you know, I loved animals, and, and uh, veterinary medicine just appealed to me. Tennessee did not have a, a veterinary school, so I said, well, I'll try to get in Colorado because we had vacations. When I was working for Slim, at the end of the season, we'd go out to Colorado, and I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Loved the mountains, and I thought, well, it'd be a good place to go to school. Like, and at that time, I was still single and mm -hmm. had a GI Bill, so I'd go wherever I wanted to, and so. So it was I, Colorado State. Um, yes, right. Colorado State and Fort Collins is where I ultimately got my veterinary training. And I met Gwen. In, uh, in Loveland, as I told you earlier, <laughs> see that fits. In. That's perfect. Was but it a I blind was, date, or did you? No, I, you know, it, it, uh, we talk about that, and, and Gwen was, had finished college, and she was teaching. She, her mother had, had uh, worked out when she was in college out in Estes Park, Colorado, mm -hmm. during the summer. So Gwen had done that uh, for several summers while she was in college. And so after she got her teacher's certificate, she thought, well, Colorado's a good place to be. So mm -hmm. she got a job in Loveland. And I was living in Loveland and uh, working part-time and then traveling back and forth to, to school. But uh, I was just attracted to that good-looking redhead. And you know, she was, uh, and I guess in Loveland, there was not too many <laughs> young people around. And, but I was, Especially I with was a, a Memphis twang. Well, that, that's very uh, endearing. It, it, uh, we, we got together by uh, one of Gwen's uh, uh, good friends that taught. She was a widow and was raising, mm -hmm. a, at that time, a 12-year-old son. And so she, she got us together supper one uh, night. And then I ended up boarding with her for a while uh, with, the, with the widow. And mm -hmm. she was a wonderful cook. Florence Hennessy was her name. And, but uh, uh, then a year later, why, you Gwen and I married. were married. Yeah. Tell me, how did you get to Iowa City and decide to open after you finished college and you were married? And um, what was there some association with Iowa City? Not at all. And would you probably, read it in the newspaper or? No, I was working in in Woodstock, Illinois. That was my first job mm -hmm. out of school. And the one reason I think we ended up in in Illinois was because Gwen's family is from Illinois. She's mm -hmm. from Illinois, and we thought, well, we'd be closer to her sure. family, and and uh, so. We got a job in Woodstock, and I had worked there two years, and I was getting restless. There was no opportunity for really buying into the practice that I was in in Woodstock, and so I, I was a drug salesman, worked for Norton Laboratories, told me of this uh, opening in Iowa City. Dr. Chuck Thayer mm -hmm. was going over to the university to start their animal care program. He was the, the one that really started that program there, so he was had a practice here, and, and that's the practice that I, I bought. And you were alone yeah. for 10 years, I, I said in my years. introduction. Right. That, and you were treating both large and small animals? Were you yes, large? yes. No, I, my first 10 years, I probably more large animal than small animal initially, but then as time went on, my uh, the small animal practice was uh, enlarging, and the large animal was getting smaller. Smaller. So. What what were the greatest challenges, and what did you like most in those early years of practicing? Well, the thing that I really like about veterinary medicine, other than the animals, you mm -hmm. know, that's obvious, sure. but, but uh, I like the fact that no day is ever the same. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you don't know what's, <laughs> what's going to happen, you know, who's going to call you up with a problem, but I like that. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think I would be, would have been happy in, in, in a uh, career where the, the days were pretty much the Mm -hmm. The same. I like I like the uh, you know the variety and and uh, uh, one of the things I didn't like about it was the fact that you know my uh, time was 
those were 10 years that I was on call every night, and, and uh, at that point, you mentioned that I was in, in Rotary. Uh, well, my first 10 years, I couldn't join a service club or mm -hmm. because I just couldn't take the time. Mm -hmm. So when I, I finally took on a, uh, uh, some help, well, then I was able to get into Rotary. So you weren't on call every night then when a dog or a cat or a white rat no, or well, whatever. No, it was wonderful. I felt great. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I didn't, you know, I, those early years when you're young, you know, uh, everybody's poor. Yes. <laughs> and you don't mind, you know, working hard, mm -hmm. not like that. But uh, the thing I regret, I guess, a little bit is that, you know, those 10 years, uh, Gwen uh, raised the kids by herself in a sense, you know. Sure. And, and uh, she did a pretty good job. Yeah, a very, so. very good job. Um, tell me some of the unusual animals that that have come into the clinic. Well, one of the one that comes immediately to mind uh, is uh, I got a call late one night, and sometimes my friends would get uh, you know a little too much. Uh, uh, drinking and mm -hmm. they'd call me from, from Arizona or Colorado or someplace and pretend to be a, a client with a particular problem, you know, and they'd always call late at night, maybe <laughs> two o'clock at night or something. So one night I got this call and this guy said, uh, say doc, he said my, my gallery, uh, my gallery can't go to the bathroom. And I said, gosh, that's, that's too bad. And I said, that's, 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 that's so serious, you know, just kind of kidding along. Mm -hmm. and, Pretty soon, I, I got the impression this was a serious call. <laughs> so I never heard of a gallop. What is before. a gallop? Well, they're they're marsupials. They're uh -huh. about this high, uh -huh. and the long tail, and got great big button eyes. I mean, they just looked like a teddy bear, little mm -hmm. rounded. This the man, the owner of it was a, a professor at the university, and he had gotten it. He had been in, in, on a sabbatical in in England, mm -hmm. and they were fairly popular pets there. But he, he only weighed about uh, I don't know, four or five pounds, mm -hmm. I guess. But he came down. I said, "Okay, I'll take a look at him." And and when I palpated his abdomen, sure enough, you could feel it a little. It felt like you know it was a, a bladder stone. Mm -hmm. He actually couldn't <laughs> couldn't <laughs> urinate, you know. So the uh, uh, reason I'm telling this, I may be the only uh, veterinarian that's ever done a cystotomy on a gallaby. I don't know, <laughs> but. I said, well, I've never operated on a gallop before, but uh, uh, I'll go over, the, in fact, I went over to the university mm -hmm. and got some of the medication they use for monkeys for anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Did it survive? The, Did it survive? Yes, it survived, and, and uh, uh, the man brought her back a week later when I was taking the sutures out of it, why well, you're needed all over me, so I knew that you knew You knew you were successful? <laughs> right. Do you approach every animal the same? Well, I mean, you can't let them ever smell that you're afraid. Well, you? you know, even that little gallaby was you know, a little vicious little rascal, but the owner, he just would pin his hands behind while we gave him the injection, you know, but just like you would hold a person, he, he, he put his, held his hands behind his back. But, uh, no, you, you have a, you know, from horses, uh, uh, another animal that I had, uh, I got a call again, it was late at night, and this man called and said, say, Doc, uh, can I leave my tiger with you tonight? And I thought, well, sure, and I was just thinking, tiger, cat, you know, and, and uh, it was always dark, and I went down to the clinic and, and uh, uh, opened my door and started uh, towards the clinic door, and all of a sudden I felt something tugging on my pants. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked back and I almost jumped out of my skin. <laughs> thought this was a full-grown, real tiger. It was a, a Bengal tiger, and this man was what he was. Gosh. Obviously, he was, uh, he was safe, and had been declawed. And oh, he was uh, declawed. Right, but he was taking him to from Ohio out to California to make a some kind of a ad or in the movie somehow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he wanted to know if he, he had talked to a policeman, and, and they had given him my name as the place he might leave him. So, mm -hmm. so that's how he got my name. So uh, when, he, when he got there, I said, well, now, we'll kind of keep this quiet. I don't, I don't want everybody knowing I've got a tiger in, in the place. The press Mainly, will descend on that, you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how that happened. And, of course, every policeman, you know, they told each other, and everybody that had kids, they were bringing, coming down to see the tiger. And I had it about, you know, five days, I guess. But it wasn't sick. It just needed a place no, to board? No, that's right. And, and it did have, I guess, I, it did have worms. And you treated <laughs> so that. I treated that. I, 
I went over to Gay's locker and got uh, 12 pounds of raw hamburger every day to feed it. But he played just like a, a kitten. You know, he lay on his back, but he mm -hmm. had, we had these big plastic uh, pails, and he was smashing those things and just playing like a. But that was the most beautiful and most unusual animal that I've been real close to. And, and you saw a picture there. Yes. Of, uh, and, uh, it's uh, one big cat. Now big tell cat. me, you got bit once that it, very seriously that you you almost lost the ability to operate. When that was just a really friendly dog. That's right. No, I I've been bitten a lot of times uh, it, it, and uh, through the years. But this one uh, uh, was an old dog that was just poking pills down, and I got a little careless, and on about the fourth pill, he decided to jump down, <laughs> and he bit my my thumb and. Uh, Actually, it you know it went down to the bone, and the bone got infected. In fact, the chip of the bone was off, and I didn't know that. I kept practicing, and I'd go to the doctors, and he'd lance it, and it went on for a while. And pretty soon, they X-rayed it and showed that it had to had to be uh, hmm. uh, surgically removed. But uh, I you were lucky. Weren't I was you? lucky. Yeah, yeah, because I know the radiologist that took the X-ray was a friend of ours, and he told my other friends that I was going to lose that thumb. He said, "There's no way he mm -hmm. can." That he's not going to lose that because it was what they call a sequestrum, and and uh, but it was uh, they were successful and and uh, operated on obviously. <laughs> so. I don't know how you could continue to put pills down dogs' no. mouths. That would I mean. Well, it you know that again. It's just you you it's that's part of your the, training really mm -hmm. training and, and. Are there any dog breeds that are inherently mean, or is it? Is it kind of the owners that trains them that That's, way? That, I think you had a good point there, really, because I think I can't say that any breed, and I've seen just about all of them, and, and, but you can sometimes look at the owner and say, well, that owner shouldn't have that particular mm -hmm. breed because they don't have. I know probably personally, uh, you'd probably talk to uh, 100 veterinarians, maybe get uh, many different answers, but uh, the one that I always respected when I was treating was mm -hmm. the Malamute. And uh, they, I treated several of them, and they just, you know, you can't, uh, uh, you can't uh, talk harshly to a Malamute, or they won't uh, tolerate that. I mean, they might with the owner, but uh, not. What not, do they do if you well, talk they, harshly? Well, <laughs> they'll, they'll bite you. They'll bite. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I always. They wouldn't there. open their mouth and have right. their pill already. No, that's right. I wouldn't want to. Uh, uh, Shove it down a, a, a mountain unless he was real sick. Hmm. <laughs> so. Tell me, uh, we mentioned uh, Gwen kind of had those first 10 years when you were working. Sorry, tell me a little bit about your children and your grandchildren. I know they, those grandchildren are very dear to your heart. Yes, they sure are. Uh, well, my son, I have two children, mm -hmm. Steve, uh, uh, and Steve unfortunately uh, passed away at the age of 35 from uh, lung cancer. And this was out of the blue, really, because Steve was, a, was an athlete, was very, never smoked in his life, and, and was, had felt good up to this point, uh, and, and it hit him, and within about less than a month after they diagnosed it, it was gone. And uh, He was so, a successful coach at Wisconsin. Yeah, you know, uh, fortunately, again, he had achieved kind of a pinnacle of his, uh, profession in a short period of time. He, he started out as an assistant coach uh, out in the University of Pacific, uh, and they won the national championship while he was an assistant coach. So that helped him get a head coach, I think, uh, here uh, as a, at a young age. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he was just 30 when he went to Wisconsin. They were at the bottom of the heap, uh, women's volleyball, and, and uh, Steve had a program, and he said, well, well he's had a five-year program, and, and he was ahead of time, because in four years, they were the Big Ten champions and the regional champions, and he was the Big Ten coach of the year and the regional coach of the year. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of accolades, but uh, Steve's uh, impact was not just in coaching. I mean, he, he influenced a lot of, uh, a lot of lives, mm -hmm. uh, and because he was a good Christian man, and, and his influence was great on the, on the women. They taught, mm -hmm. and also everybody that knew him, you know. And those, and, and his he two had those sons, <laughs> Ian, who was twelve, and mm -hmm. Jeff is eight. Uh, Steve passed away four years ago, and and uh, but those boys are, of course, Ian is he's a, just like another Steve. I mean, mm -hmm. he just looks like him so much, and uh, acts like him. And Jeff is a joy. They're both both joys, and mm -hmm. and uh, they 
I'm uh, daughter Kathy. I, uh, I know you've met, and, uh -huh. and uh, she uh, is married to Victor Harris, and they they've been married about 11 years now, living in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Oh, that and, Colorado influence. Yeah, that's right. You can't right. take that's Colorado right. out no, of that no. your family, can that's you? That's right. And Kathy, she was born in Loveland, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but uh, she. Yeah, they, they love Colorado. They and there's really, there's yeah. cyclists and uh, right. kayakers. And yeah, great uh, outdoors uh, uh, people. Kathy just completed a cross country ride with a group of eight that went from San Diego to San Augustine, Florida, in mm -hmm. two months. And uh, so, and and she has a dog. Does she have a dog? Golden Retriever. Golden Retriever. Right. What was your dog? Well, it was a Golden Retriever. The golden Retriever. Uh, was, well, I had several, several. naturally through the years, but I, my favorite was, was the Golden, a golden Retriever. Retriever. Is that right. the one you went out with uh, Mr. Summerwell? Yes. You, right. you and he had a very good friendship, and you were... Very much so. Uh-huh. He was, you know, I... Uh, Bill... This is Bill Summerwell. That's right. W.W. Uh -huh. Bill uh, was, when I first came to town, I, he advised me in a lot of things uh, when I was buying the property for the clinic and, and, and he's never charged me anything for that and, and but his his love of animals and especially golden retrievers because he was Mr. Golden Retriever in this area and uh, uh, we shared that and I, I hunted with him and, and uh, but he was just a real good friend and of course everybody knows Bill mm -hmm. but, uh Tell me Jim I know your father taught you or gave you the advice of whatever work you do enjoy it and your mother said whatever you want in life it's out there for you what what is some of your uh thoughts or has what has life taught you and um has given you the most meaning well i think that was good advice mm -hmm. and and uh, it, it's uh dad i mentioned that he was a traveling salesman but dad was was really he was an introvert and he had no business being a salesman because <laughs> he was much happier uh, with a book and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he loved, he read voraciously. And, uh, but he, uh, he was in a job and he was doing the Depression years. He had four children. We never went hungry, mm -hmm. but he never made a lot of money, but it was steady and he just never, uh, but he, he, he went to work on Monday and it was, he was not happy mm -hmm. about it. So he wanted and, uh, you to be happy in your work, right, and you right. have obviously oh, have yeah. been all these years. Yeah, I've you know I've talked to several high school groups about career days, and mm -hmm. I can honestly say that uh, uh, looking back, I don't know of anything that I would rather have done than practice veterinary medicine. I mean, as long as I had to work for a living, why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, and mom, uh, she instilled in I think all of us children a, a good sense of uh, self worth mm -hmm. and and like I say whatever you want uh, uh, you can get and as far as my own children I told them the same thing about being happy in their, in their career choices mm -hmm. and I think Steve was extremely happy in what he did mm -hmm. Kathy uh, is a family counselor uh, a psychologist and and I think she's good at that and she's she's happy in that and I mm -hmm. think they both uh, and Kathy certainly knows how to enjoy life. <laughs> and you're enjoying life now, retired and right. uh, traveling and um, right. playing now some golf? Yes, yeah. That's I, good. Yeah. Uh, and spending some time with those grandchildren of you yours. You bet, you bet. Well, Jim, it's been a real pleasure having you a guest. And uh, I know you're going to have a wonderful trip. You're going to take your grandchildren fishing and uh, have a wonderful time. And thanks for coming today. Thank you. My guest on One of a Kind has been Dr. Jim Lowe. For 35 years, Jim practiced veterinary medicine in Iowa City. Many a night's sleep was interrupted with a call to come to an aid of a sick animal, large and small. A gentleman and a gentleman. Jim's dedication to his veterinary practice, to his wife, children, grandchildren, his church, and the community has been exemplary. He is a man of warmth and goodwill. Jim Lowe is one of a kind. Mm -hmm.